Okay, hello again. Welcome back to our great text discussion of John Dewey's Art as Experience. Today we're discussing Chapter 5, The Expressive Object. Now the term expression refers both to uh, an act, according to Dewey, or a process, you might say, as well as the um, result of that process, or the product of that act. Um, and, De and Dewey uh, is fond of pointing out in various works that uh, there are lots of terms that work this way. Um, uh, he mentions construction here. Construction is the process, and a construction is what you create. Um, work, similarly, you do work and produce a work. Um, history, um, the uh, history unfolds, right? And then we talk about it as history. Um, and experience, similarly. You have experiences, um, and then, and then uh, at the end, what you have accumulated is experience. Right? Um, now, uh, last chapter focused mainly on the act of expression, okay? And so it uh, obviously focused more on the activities of making and doing that are involved in the creation of art. This chapter focuses more on the result, okay? And so also has uh, relatively more about the appreciation or consumption of art than the last chapter did. Um, now, uh, you'll remember that uh, we discussed last time uh, the question of what uh, is expressed in an act of expression, or we might uh, put it a little bit differently here. What does the art object express? Um, Another way to ask the same question is to ask, what does the art object represent? Um, so we might think in terms of a few, uh, a few examples, right? Like, what does uh, this portrait express or represent? Does it just express um, uh, a, a representation of what uh, this guy looks like? Uh, Albrecht Dürer, in this case, is the self-portrait. Um, does it just represent him, or does it represent something else? Uh, what about this portrait, uh, so to speak, um, uh, if, that's what, if that's what that is? What does it represent? What does it express? Um, take this uh, painting of a bridge that, um, by Van Gogh, by Vincent Van Gogh, that uh, Dewey refers to in the chapter. What does it represent? What does it express? Is what it represents different from what is represented in this photograph of a bridge? Um, or do they simply differ because the photograph is more recent, um, uh, of a more recent bridge um, than Van Gogh, uh, from a different angle, say? What does this painting um, by uh, Mondrian uh, represent? Um, what does it express? Uh, if anything. One uh, common or perhaps naive account of what uh, an art object is supposed to represent is the, the subject matter it's about, right? You might think of this as a, a kind of copy theory of representation. Um, and then the associated sort of aesthetic criteria would be how well does it depict, how accurately does it depict the thing that it represents, right? Um, and we might see uh, on this account modern art, which is non-representational, as sort of somehow defective. Um, now, Dewey obviously rejects this theory. He uh, refers to Matisse, um, who, by the way, uh, did this uh, lovely um, lithographic portrait of Dewey uh, there on the right side. Um, so Dewey refers to Matisse, who's, who's supposed to have said that the the camera was a great boon to painters precisely because it relieved them of any apparent necessity of copying objects, right? Um, so the idea is that, that the, the painter previously had uh, a, a kind of um, uh, task set on them of copying the visual presentation of objects that the camera freed them from the necessity of that, something like this. Um, a related view that Dewey talks about is uh, the notion of representation as uh, in the sense of symbolic representation. So in a symbolic representation, meaning is a kind of 
standing for something else or a leading to, right? So algebraic symbols um, stand for numbers. Uh, quantities in a physical equation stand for um, measurable properties of things. Road signs point to or lead you to um, places um, and tell you, you know, how to get there, how long it'll take you to get there, and so on, right? Um, so these kinds of symbolic representations uh, represent uh, or have their meaning by virtue of, of standing for something else that's different from them. Right? Um, artistic representation, on the other hand, Dewey tells us, is, is somehow immediate or inherent in the experience itself. So they cr art, artworks create an experience, and the meaning of the art is in the experience of the artwork. Um, now, of course, he qualifies this in a certain way. Um, he tells us that a poem and picture present material passed through the alembic of personal experience. They have no precedence in existence or in universal being. But nonetheless, their material came from the public world and so has qualities in common with the material of other experiences while the product awakens in other persons new perceptions of the meanings of the common world. Um, so, you know, a poem or a painting, it has a subject matter. It, it, it has uh, images or words in it that come with prior meanings, okay, um, uh, from our common experience, um, but they put them into a new set of relationships. You might think of Dewey as saying in this passage that all art is a kind of remix, although Dewey didn't know about remix. Um, I think he might appreciate the, the sentiment there. Um, Dewey uh, tries to get at this distinction in a different way uh, when he says that, um, when he makes a contrast between science and art. So he says, um, science, on the one hand, states meanings, whereas art expresses meanings, right? So the idea is that science is meant to somehow describe the way things are um, uh, apart from the description, whereas art um, expresses meanings through itself, right? There's no separation from uh, the, the, the expression and the meaning of the expression, right? So let's come back to this picture by Vincent van Gogh, uh, this painting by Vincent van Gogh. Um, now Dewey describes van Gogh, um, or he, sorry, Dewey quotes van Gogh describing this image to his brother. He says, um, in a letter to his brother Theo, I have a view of the Rhone, the iron bridge at Trinquetale. Um, in which the sky and the river are the color of absinthe, the quays a shade of lilac, the figures leaning on their elbows on the parapet blackish, the iron bridge an intense blue with a note of vivid orange in the blue background, and a note of intense malachite green. Another very crude effort, and yet I am trying to get at something utterly heartbroken and therefore utterly heartbreaking. Look at the picture again for a second. You can see uh, some of that, the lilac uh, quays, the absinthe colored sea, uh, or water rather, and air, um, the blackish figures, the blue bridge. Um, uh, you can't see heartbreak, perhaps, um, uh, but you can see a lot of the other things he describes. Now Dewey says, these words taken by themselves are not expression. They only hint at it. The expressiveness, the aesthetic meaning, meaning is the picture itself. Okay. Um, and he says, you know, he gives us the quote from the letter and the picture, uh, or asks us to think about the picture uh, in order to get at, quote, the difference between statement and expression. Okay, so the, the copy theory or the symbolic theory of art um, uh, uh, is problematic, okay, um, in terms of understanding the meaning of art. The alternative account, um, what he's in, in a way calls the esoteric theory of art, 
um, says, on the other hand, that the subject matter of art is irrelevant. What, what is depicted um, can only um, just sort of distract from, uh, from the value of art. Um, and it's the esoteric theory um, that might be taken as holding up abstract art as, um, a, as sort of the primary example, because like, it's freed from those common associations and uh, sort of the depictions of the everyday. So this is a piece by Kandinsky called Composition 7 uh, from 1913. So Dewey may, may have been familiar with it. Um, or other work by, other abstract work by Kandinsky. Um, so Dewey re rejects also the um, esoteric theory of art, and he does that because he, th he thinks it ignores the way, even in abstract art, that um, the artist and the perceiver are bringing in pre-existing meanings. I mean, even, you know, look at these um, marks on a page. I mean, these are, these are not fully pieces of art. Um, they're just a, a drawing exercise uh, taken off a random website. Uh, so, so different attempts at a drawing exercise. Um, and you can ask, are these lines just meaningless marks on the page or do they bring with them some kind of meanings from past experiences? Some associations with either physical things um, uh, that they resemble or emotional states that they might convey. Right, um, and you know Dewey tells us that that we should expect that to be the case. That we should have some associations, some some meanings that we attribute to these lines in virtue of just their appearance, um, and that the artist uses that uh, as raw material. Um, you look at these lines; are they different from the first set? Uh, not just in their shape but in how they make you feel, what they suggest. I mean, obviously they don't signify anything, they don't depict anything in particular, but do they, um, do they nevertheless carry some kind of meaning, uh, at least uh, embryonically? Um, you know, similarly, these different lines uh, and marks, or, or these, right? Do these have some kind of um, some kind of weight, some kind of uh, uh, familiarity, some kind of a meaningfulness or value uh, to you. Okay, we'll probably talk about some of those examples uh, in class. Um, so, uh, you know, just, just keep those in mind. How did you feel about those, um, all those line drawings um, or those marks on the page and and um, and how are they different from each other. So that's all I really wanted to cover today. Of course there are many more interesting things going on in the chapter uh, that I didn't touch on, uh, as there always are, but um, please feel free to raise them in class or in the discussion boards um, or in the comments of this video. So uh, that's, that's it for today. See you again soon.